Okay. Not that I, we necessarily need the mic right now, but uh, that's, but there's people going to be that are yeah. watching us at home. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm really excited um, that you all are here. This is great. Uh, so thank you all for coming out to the sort of final reveal, I suppose, of the uh, Confluence Park uh, design. Uh, so I'm excited to to um, see what you all have and to have a conversation about it. Um, the way that this time will more or less be structured is we're going to hear from um, Vermont River Conservancy and um, I, McBroom and Malona McBroom, Malona, Malona McBroom um, uh, about uh, the the plans, uh, and then I th uh, if there are you know sort of just uh, clarifying questions as we go, I assume clarifying questions are probably fine, but we'll have uh, more time for more in depth questions um, at the end. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Does that sound? So any other I'll comments? Do, I'll, I'll do a little intro. And okay, and great. So um, that's it for me. Awesome. Thanks okay, all for being thank here. Thank you. Yeah. And when you all speak, you oh, use. is it that mic there? Uh, I don't know. It probably is both. This one here. <laughs> thank you. Great. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here on uh, what feels like the first uh, night of fall. Getting chilly out there. And uh, thank you also to Orca Media for recording this. It, it is live streamed now. And then the recording will be available tomorrow on their website and YouTube. And I'm just very appreciative of all that Orca Media does to keep our community informed and engaged. So many thanks. And I was thinking to, we'll, we'll do a presentation, I'll do a brief introduction here and then hand it off to Malone and McBroom. And it would be great to hold your questions and comments to the end. And then when you do, um, if you do wish to come up and have a comment or um, question, if you could do so in the microphone so that those listening at home can hear you. Uh, so I want to introduce myself. I'm Ricarda Erickson with the Vermont River Conservancy. And also from the Vermont River Conservancy is our Executive Director, Steve Libby, here tonight. And VRC is a nonprofit land trust protecting land along rivers throughout Vermont for public access, for conservation, and for encouraging flood adaptive communities. And a year and a half ago, VRC started an initiative called Face the River. We wanted to facilitate community discussions to think about how we relate to our rivers in a new way. And all too often in our cities and town centers, we have built structures around our rivers and essentially we don't see them, we don't interact with them or relate with them, and we have turned our backs to them. And so through a series of public outreach events and presentations in Montpelier, we heard from many of you in and around Montpelier about your relationship to Montpelier's rivers and how you would like to improve the way we see and relate to our rivers, how we as Montpelier can turn and face our rivers. What we heard from you was excitement and potential of what could be. And more specifically, we heard from so many people that you want a riverside park in Montpelier at the confluence of the North Branch and main stem of the Winooski River. And we personally loved that idea, and so did Mayor Ann Watson. She was listening in, and she loved the idea too. And VRC loved this idea of a confluence river park so much that we decided to apply for some grant funding to see if we could get a conceptual design for such a park. We received that grant funding. We went to the city council. We got their approval to go ahead with this work. And the first thing we did was we created an advisory group comprised of 17 people from a variety of backgrounds and professions. Many of them are here tonight, so thank you to our advisory group for helping us along the way. The second thing we did was put out an RFP to initiate this step of creating a conceptual design for the park. And out of several very qualified proposals from throughout the country, we hired Mylone and McBroom to do this work. And the team is led by Roy Schiff, a water resources engineer from Montpelier, and Regina Leonard, a landscape architect. 
and it has been our pleasure to work with Roy and Regina and that they're capable and creative team and they have far exceeded our expectations in creating this vision, this conceptual design of what a Confluence River Park could be. So I'll now hand it over to Regina to describe to you the process that they went through to provide some background and ultimately to reveal to you tonight the final conceptual design for the Confluence River Park. Hi, I, I'm gonna back up a little bit and I just wanna talk about the context and, and you know, as you all know, there's a lot of exciting things happening right now, um, which goes kind of, you know, hand in glove with the whole vision to reorient your community toward the river. Um, you know, with the Clean Water Act in the 70s and the rivers getting healthier and wildlife coming back, communities all through the country are reorienting themselves to the river. Um, and I think by way of the development and some of the other investments that are happening in your downtown, it just makes this project um, really, really integral to that whole opportunity and making that happen. So um, what we wanted to show is just the context of things that are happening. And so if you look at this visual, you can see the green star is where the, the Confluence River Park is proposed. And so when we're talking about that, um, you can see that's where it is. Um, just to the east or, or on the other side of the river is, is Shaw's, just to orient everybody. We have Main Street sort of diagonal across um, the right-hand side of the slide. The new transit center um, is just to the west. And if you look at the dashed line, that's approximate location of the new shared use path. Um, the red stars indicate places that are in transition, where there's been some community discussion about what's next and opportunities for revitalization. And so there's a lot of exciting things that are happening. And Confluence River Park uh, sits right in the middle of all those exciting things. So when we were brought on board, um, we were told there were certain design considerations that should guide this effort. Um, one, obviously, is, is river access. It sits right on the river, but one of the things that we wanted to do is look at river access and what level w was feasible to provide river access. We also wanted to look at accessibility so that we could get as many users into the park space, enjoying the park space, and possibly enjoying the river as possible. And we wanted to look at expanding recreational opportunities from this site. Flood storage and resiliency were also important topics. As you all know, this is an area that floods every season. Um, and so we were thinking um, as we were moving through that ways to increase flood storage and resiliency. The context and history, this is um, in the capital city. It's right downtown. There's a certain flavor uh, that Montpelier has. And so as we were developing the designs, we were constantly thinking about how to fit it into place. And we relied on the community and input from the community to help us. And finally, creating this exciting public space. We weren't sure when we started out what the community was looking for for a public space. And, and I'll talk about a lot of the community input that we went through in order to find out what the community wanted in that public space. And finally, the integration of the shared use path. There were a lot of ways in which the space could uh, react with, interact with the shared use path. And so we investigated that through design, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. So just to orient people that you may know where the project site is, but it's wholly different when you go down into the project site. And so Roy's going to take a few minutes sort of walk you through the project area. All right, thanks. Okay, so here's a drone photo of the site. Um, you all probably are familiar with it. The north branch is running right to left on the screen, joins the uh, larger Winooski River. You can see at the bottom of the screen the Shaw's in the back parking lot. Um, this, pro this photo was taken um, a couple months, a couple months before the uh, new bridge uh, went in for the bike path. And 
Um, a couple things to discuss. Um, one of the prominent features in the river on the north branch is the uh, uh, trestle dam, also known as the rat dam, you can see on the right. It's a very low head dam. Um, what you don't see is under the trestle bridge, the railroad bridge, is a bedrock grade control structure that crosses the river. And there's actually several bedrock grade controls that are all around um, the main stem Winooski. Um, and it's a really magical spot. There's a lot of wildlife still Excuse there. Me, would you say what is a bedrock? Yeah, pieces of bedrock that are sticking out of the river. Is that because they're bedrock sticking up or because people have Put them in there. No, it's natural. It's natural. sticking, okay. sticking okay. out of the Sorry. ground. Yep. And what that does is that kind of controls the bottom of the river elevation, so it doesn't dive down or move. Um, so you can go on to the next slide. So that's the river setting. Um, one thing you, that's really obvious when you get down here and when you look at the site is there's a very small area of vegetation around the rivers, and that's a long-term vision is to revegetate these rivers. Um, this is the actual bank, the corner where the main stem and north branch meet, and it's a lot of um, it's ages of uh, construction rubble, industrial rubble, concrete, metal, glass, um, automobile parts from some of the land uses that were ha taking place right in this area. Some train parts, it looks like, and a lot of um, invasive or um, uh, maybe non-native vegetation is located on these banks right now. There's actually not a lot of vegetation as you can see in this picture. Now here's the uh, a shot right upstream of the trestle bridge. Um, this is the new abutment for the pedestrian bridge and I took this photo um, as I was going down to look at uh, river water levels and what you see is that the old stone walls in the back are all flooded. This is uh, April 15th. We had quite a wet April and May um, in the area and the water levels pond up through this area. So you'll see the water level rise five or six feet um, more, um, in, this, in this area. And you, if you've been down there, um, this is the same, same location but under lower flow. Um, that's the stone wall on the right. That's part of the trestle bridge. And these are two stream gauges we've been looking at to monitor the water levels and help us place the park elevate features at the proper elevation. That's an ongoing water level study. Um, we can talk more about it if folks are interested. And this is looking back upstream. You can see the trestle bridge and the, the trestle dam, excuse me, in the background, the long parallel line in the river. This is looking up the north branch. And the stone there is the uh, protection on the abutments of the new um, bike path bridge that's now been installed. Here's the bridge looking downstream um, from the parking lot, um, the former uh, farmers market or the farmers market parcel and again looking at the confluence. So um, an interesting thing about this area is that the two water levels go together on the main stem and on the north branch um, and those are dictated by very different things in different watersheds in the state. Um, from up in Worcester and from up in Cabot, those all converge at the spot. It's a really amazing natural spot um, that people don't get to enjoy right now. So, just wanted to take um, a minute to talk about the public or the, the whole process that we went through. And I know a lot of you participated um, in the outreach, a lot of you were on the committee um, or on council. But, you know, initially what we did is we gathered all of the prior community input. You, you had started this conversation about the riverfront a very long time ago. And so we gathered all that information and we started to try to understand it. Um, and then we went out into the community and we started meeting and getting input. We developed um, three concepts. I'll, I'll take a little bit of time to talk about those um, and the important features of them that assisted us in decision making. Once we got those three concepts, we, um, we went to council and we had a few more uh, meetings and we thought we understood the feedback. So we prepared a fourth design, concept D, and I'll talk about that too. Um, from there, we continued with the outreach and then to where we are today, um, We've had a community survey. I'll share the results with you. All of that input led us here today um, to what we're calling the concept E or the final concept. So 
along the way, um, we met with lots of people. When we met um, back in May, I think we presented the three initial concepts to the city council, and at that t time, um, they asked us to continue work, but to um, really meet with more groups, more user groups. And so you can see that we really picked up and um, we, we started meeting with all of the interested parties. So we met with the people that take care of the park. We met with the fire and safety people. We met with the train people, um, the, the river folks. So we, we tried to reach out to as many people as possible to get feedback um, and input on the design process. Uh, we had a couple of, uh, we had a community event at the farmer's market, which was a blast. Um, we talked to a lot of people. And then we also had a couple of public workshops as well. The latest one was back in July. So when we started the project, we, we started with three kind of main um, approaches to the park design. We thought we knew what people kind of wanted. We had a big laundry list, but obviously we, we need to prioritize what would fit on the site. And there were different ways that we could integrate the bike path. There were different levels of accessibility. There was the balancing act between is this more of a river park or is it more of a park at the top of the river? And so these three initial concepts were really asking those questions um, by way of design. So in concept A, the strategy here was to really create more of a larger public space at the top of the park. Um, and so the bike path winds through it. There's a big performance area. Um, but what that does is that, that, may, that compresses the slope. And so the access down to the river was limited because there was less space to get people down there. The second concept, concept B, was really focused on integrating the park experience in, fully with the bike path. And so um, in this design, we had a slightly smaller um, park space at the top of the park with a big central focal point um, and some cultural elements. But the idea was that we integrated traffic calming and moved bicycles right into the park space. And then this one also integrated um, an accessible ramp to provide um, accessibility all the way down to a fishing platform about four feet above the water level. And then finally on this, the third idea, the concept C, um, the focus there is, okay, what if we had the bike path that segregated the two spaces? So west of the bike path, we had more of a seating area, a place to, for people to come eat their lunch maybe, um, but it's more of a, of a passive, rec space that had more to do with the bike path. And then the other side, the river side, became more of a riverine park. And we had smaller gathering spaces. Um, we had ADA access all the way down to a fishing platform. And so we had these three concepts that handled the design program in different ways. And we were interested to see what the community would tell us about what they wanted, what, what was their priority. So. Essentially, what we heard from people um, was wrapped into concept D at the time. And so what we heard from people is, you know, I really like having open space at the top, but maybe not so much open space. Um, but I really want the small niche spaces, those small little seating areas at different levels all along the path. People really like those. They like the idea that they could find a private space to go sit and have their lunch. Um, we heard from people that, you know, we want a boat launch and we want fairly easy access. And so we really want you to really think harder about how to get boats down to the riverfront. So with this concept, we, we established a, uh, an offloading area and an accessible parking space. And we oriented that toward a, a boat launch area. Um, we also tried really hard to get accessibility all the way down to the riverfront so that you had an accessible path and along the way the niche, niches. Um, so this concept really balanced all those things. And so the next thing we did is we sort of grouped all of these concepts and then we went out into the community and we met 
with people, and this is at the farmer's market, um, and we timed that with a community survey. And so this was sort of our launch where we went and talked with people, we had the community survey, we pointed more people to that. Um, and this was really helpful to us. And the community survey was open uh, most of the summer. We closed it at the end of the summer. We had 112 responses. Um, but what we did is we really looked hard at, at we had a lot of what, what's called open answers. And so, um, you know, we would say, what would you be most likely to do at the park? And people would answer. And then what we did is we went through all the answers and we created this typology or groups of, of answers, the themes of answers, and then we crunch those numbers. And so what we found is that most people that were responding to the survey, the common denominator that most people said was a top activity was really just sitting and relaxing at the park. Picnicking and eating was really popular. A lot of people said that they would go and sit and have their lunch. Um, but also, you know, the idea of using it for recreation. So using the bike path, walking, um, running through the area, that was also really important. So we were able to really better understand what, what was important to people in terms of how they would use their park. When we asked them what's the most important activity or what's the most likely activity, you can see this is the trends of the answers. So, you know, people sitting and picnicking and, and walking and just enjoying the re river, just sitting and relaxing, enjoying the river, um, was very popular. And, and people said that they, they would do a lot of that. But interestingly, that's very passive, those activities. We also wanted to know, well, would you be likely to do active recreation? So would you use this park to swim or kayak? And a resounding percentage of people said yes, they would. 69% of the survey respondents said that they would recreate actively from the park. So they would swim or kayak, fish. And we thought that was very interesting. So it really told us that we need to create a balance of spaces for people. And then finally, remember the question of we were trying to balance this park spaces um, when we looked at initial concepts? We floated that as a question, and we said, you know, what's what's the what do you think is the most important kind of balance of, of uses in the park space? And it was rather almost tied. People wanted um, a larger space down near the river's edge, and they also wanted um, those small niche spaces all along the way. So pri small smaller private seating areas, um, and then also more space at the river. And this is just shows the trends and the answers for the question, what elements of the concept designs um, were most important. As you can see, um, the river was high and spaces near the river, park spaces, the designs, people had favorite design approaches, um, but essentially it was river and river access and park space. And then finally we asked what design people liked best and fairly overwhelmingly people chose D, which told us that we had listened when we were talking with people and trying to integrate comments into a refined design, which we were calling concept D. So those were the results of the, of the survey and the outreach. And what we did after that is we refined the design program. Um, Again, we knew that the refined design had to kind of have that balance of spaces. Um, river access was really important, but it needed to be balanced with the other uses that people wanted there. Um, people really liked the idea of the bike path being somewhat integrated, but they didn't want activity or movement on the bike path to be um, impeded in any way by a park element or feature. And Accessibility, we heard from a lot of people, make it accessible. We want to get people all the way down to the river. We also heard that in-river recreation was really important. And passive recreation seating 
picnicking, eating, reading, watching, um, the balancing of those activities was, was part of our refined design program. Um, and finally, the environment. We heard from a lot of people that they wanted a softer park environment, something with native vegetation, more grass, um, but at the same time, people did care a lot about the flood resilience of the design solution um, and the water quality. We also heard from fire and police safety that the integration of, of visibility into spaces and not creating hidden spaces was really important to them. They needed to have their eyes on spaces. Um, and so we took all of these into consideration as we refined the design. So the final concept is really, this picture really shows it its prominence right at the confluence. So it's got the main stem of the Winooski and the north branch. And the point of land is, is at the confluence. And that's where most of the park features are. That's where the wide point of the um, park space at the river is. Um, and as the river gets um, improved and restored and the, and the health comes back, um, activity in the river will relate to the features and the access that is provided through, through this space. So just kind of a large overview of this concept and, and certainly you know, we, can, we can answer questions, but the crux of, of what this design does is it balances that upper open space. So it provides an open green space at the top but it's oriented and shifted the seating. It's got um, tiered bench seating, um, like steps, like you'd sit on the steps of City Hall. Um, that's the kind of seating. So people can come and sit and have their lunch and look out into the river. They've got a berm with plantings at their back. Um, we retained the easy boat launch access um, and, and um, accessible parking. We've integrated, um, as with Concept D, an opportunity for people that are biking through the area to park their bikes or fill up their water bottles um, and, and really enjoy the park space. We provided um, a little performance area. One thing that we heard from people is that we know that the upper area is not that big, but we'd really like to have some kind of performance um, shelter so that maybe it's temporary um, but we might want to have it covered so that if we want to have a band or there's an event that we have a covering and so the orange on the plan just shows where that performance space may be it's an informal area but you can put up a canopy and the idea is that you could have small events at the top of the park there um, this integrates um, small niche spaces and overlooks throughout with big boulders set in for seating or set into um, the sides of the wall so that throughout there's opportunities to just sit and enjoy the environment. The, there's an accessible path which is, the entrance is um, at the top of the site on the right just to the top of the um, temporary canopy. And that's where you would access the, the path, and then you wind down and you come into a series of small niche spaces. And if you keep winding down around, um, you've got these small planting areas with native plants and trees, and you can walk all the way down to the river. So we've tried to hit an elevation that's slightly above the normal river line. And we've also provided an area for the kayak and boat launches um, to get into their, their boats from the offload area. Um, and again, the larger space is at the water's edge, and we've integrated some of those natural features. So to get a better sense of what this looks like, we cut a couple of section elevations. So um, that dashed line at the lower image kind of we cut the site and it's you're looking to the east in this picture um, so if you start at the top of the cut line that's to the left 
and you can see what you're looking at is a small planted berm that provides some separation from the railroad corridor and then the long area is that bench seating that I was talking about, the tiered seating. And then boulders and a planted space provides a little bit of separation from the shared use path. And we're showing here the, there's a small little water fill station and the shared use path, which is bordered by um, a retaining wall. And this is um, an area where if you figure that you're entering at the top of the site, by the time you get down to where this cut line is on the path, you're going down quite a bit in grade. And so the height of the wall is actually the highest at this point. Um, so you can see that, you know, we've used boulders to soften the wall. And you can see the, if you look at the dashed line, that's the existing grade. So you can see that in order to make more space at the river's edge, we're actually cutting into the slope. So the idea is that we've got this tiered pathway that winds down through and that's stabilized by big boulders and plantings um, until you get down to the river and then there's a wider open space with seating opportunities and water access, areas to fish, areas to kind of pull up on your kayak. <clears throat> And then just one more cut through. This is looking through the actual thickest part of the site. And so the upper left of the section line, if you look at this, is where your temporary parking and your unloading zone is for the kayaks. And again, you can see the cut line. You're seeing part of the berm that provides some privacy and separation for the park. The park seating and then the open lawn area and the path that winds through that area and then you start your terracing down to the water's edge. Um, so just a little bit about materials and stabilization. Um, we would envision and, and you know the next phase of design really starts to look at the technical details um, and it would start specifying materials but a couple of considerations for materials is we were told that natural materials is what people want and so to the extent possible we've integrated lawn at the top of the site but we've inset um, large flagstones to provide accessibility accessible ac access to some of the upper areas and to the path and then i'll show you some examples of of different sites that have been stabilized that are very similar in use um, just so you can get a feel of what those materials might feel like. But we did hear loud and clear from people that they wanted a natural feeling to the park. So we're at about a 10% level of design right now. Conceptual design is really about establishing the vision um, of what's possible, what the community would like to see. The next phase of design is going to get a lot more detailed. The other thing to know is that the site is in flux and in transition. Um, and so in the middle of us doing this project, there were a lot of things that were happening contextually. So the new transportation center was being built and the new bike path or the shared use path was being built. And so there were a lot of conditions that um, once they're built would have to be verified for elevations and exactly where they ended up. Sometimes when sites are constructed, they end up a little different than the design drawings. So it's just to say that, you know, this conceptual design is at about a 10% level of, of design, but we thought it was important to show you the breakdown of, of what the costs are likely to be. You can see that, um, the bigger costs really have to do with the amount of earthwork and the terracing and the stabilization of materials. Um, and the amenities um, would also be fairly expensive if you want to have nice amenities that feel reflective of your community, um, things like your overhead uh, shelters or um, some of your lighting or um, some of the seating if, if we went with some some normal bench seating so the breakdown really is the the most expensive cost is the earthwork and the terracing and the stabilizing materials
I wanted to end um, on just the design piece with showing you what's possible um, in the long range. And these are um, river parks that were established, um, the Confluence Park in, in Denver, the Truckee River Park in Reno, and also show you the Brooklyn Bridge Park. All of these parks are fairly recent parks. They were all installed fairly recently. Um, and as you can see, the treatment of these parks down um, in the flood zone um, uses a different, different varieties of materials. So there's concrete is utilized, big boulders are stabilized with mortar or concrete. Um, and so when you get a park feature like this that's going to be flooded, um, those are the types of materials. And as you can see here, those materials they feel um, at home in the park, and you can see that they provide the access down to the river. So these are long-term visions. Um, as your river gets restored and as your recreational opportunities get improved by that restoration, um, this could be the future vi vision for Confluence River Park. And here's just another view. And I wanted to show you, um, if you look at the lower right corner, um, the reason I want to show you this is that's a material that's like a stabilized um, granite shavings. And it has a look and a feel of a stone dust surface, but it's a hardness of concrete. And so there's a lot of new exciting materials and treatments out there that would give you that natural feel without having to go to concrete for stability. And so these are the things that as the project goes forward, uh, technical design and more information, um, those are the decisions that the community will weigh in. Um, but there's a lot of choice of materials um, and uh, developing the, uh, the detailing. And you can see that upper left-hand side is the kayak launch at the Brooklyn um, River Park. So lots of exciting stuff. And with that, I just want to hand it to Steve so he can sort of wrap up the big picture for you. So I, I think one of the things that we learned going through this whole community process was, you know, we were really focused on the Confluence Park area and that, you know, relatively small area with a lot of kind of intensive design thinking. But as we, you know, talked to the community and learned, I think, about ourselves about what's the context that this park is going to be located in. And so there's, you know, it's, a, it's an urban area, so there's all the kind of like aspects of urban life that get focused on this particular park. But it's also in a river setting where you have the north branch and the main stem coming together. And it really got us thinking about, you know, the rivers themselves and how this project could kind of like energize some thinking about uh, restoring the rivers and restoring water quality and really thinking a lot about the flood aspects of this, the flood resilience aspects. So part of this, uh, end of this presentation is kind of like looking forward to the larger context of the rivers in Montpelier. And we've heard from a lot of people about, you know, having a canoe access or kayak access site here really implies that you can get to that place from other access points along the river. So we know that there's other opportunities upriver, downriver for kind of using this central collection spot as a place to, to like connect for other uh, river access areas. Um, the whole idea of bringing people down to the river really includes the responsibility of that river being clean enough for people to be there. So really focusing and working with other groups like the Friends of Winooski on, how, you know, what is the existing water quality? What do we need to do to get it to the level where you can feel comfortable in being down by the river um, and in the river itself? So um, I think uh, from our organizational point of view, it's really exciting to have this Confluence Park kind of uh, energize this larger conversation about river restoration on a larger scale in Montpelier. Um, so that's kind of the, like the next challenge is get the park built and then let's have this be a great river for that park to be part of. So. So that's great. essentially it. And um, you know, if you have questions or comments, we would welcome them. So. And I think it would be best if, it, um, if 
if you could go to the microphone um, up there with your question or comment. Perfect. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> Wake up. Sandy Parr. Um, okay, one, if we're going to have a uh, canoe, kayak, what have you, access, uh, I think along with that we need some sort of a portage to get over the dam just uh, next to Shaw's, a safe portage area, uh, and that will give you access to uh, the river further up. Another thing that uh, I'm kind of, uh, I don't know, ambivalent about is your fishing area. It doesn't look handicapped accessible because it's a bunch of steps. Uh, I would rather see maybe a ramp with a landing for people to fish off of the landing, uh, which would be a lot safer because you wouldn't have people plugging lures over the heads of other people and things like that. And the third thing uh, I want to comment is the concept of native plants. Uh, native plants mean different things to different people. And I would like to see the planting list come from plants native to Washington County. If you need a way to figure that out, you can go to Go Botany from the uh, Wild Wildflower Conservancy, formed with the New England Wildflower Society. And they have maps that show you what's, you, you look up the plant, type it into the search, and that'll show you what is native. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. And um, I just want to, those are all great points. And um, to your point about um, the portage, um, this site is actually just below that dam. So um, a, the portage wouldn't be an issue for putting in at this site. You could actually put in at the Confluence River Park and paddle to um, the next dam is in Middlesex, I believe, um, on the Winooski. However, good point, and in the broader thinking about rivers in Montpelier, um, that, that dam is certainly a consideration if we wanted to have people be able to access the, the full stretch yeah, of the you, Winooski. If you went upstream, through. you've got trouble. Right. Also, if you went upstream in the uh, North Branch, there's a little dam there just above the railroad yes. bridge, and mm -hmm. something might be done with that too for a portage, although it's not nearly so dangerous. Yeah, thank you. I know I've had many questions throughout the process, and I'm always thinking of more. Great. Um, what would be the, what's the scope of our discussion tonight as far as what would be the most helpful questions? I mean, are there any changes to be made to this, or is it things to inform city council about tomorrow night, or what's the, what's your questions are you asking? Yeah. <laughs> well, I would say from a design standpoint, um, it's never too late to give comments. Um, because the design is only a 10 percent and so your comments get recorded and then when the design gets picked back up those can get integrated and refined um, as the design moves ahead so I would say share them and, and we'll make sure that we they get integrated in the okay. next phase of design um, all right I guess my first question is have what has the data on the river shown as far as, you know, if our lowest point here is at 508 with your river gauges, how does it correspond to that? And I'll just keep it to that little niche, which is, you know, as a, I'm curious about what you found or what you know about 
what we might be facing year to year at that lowest level as far as is there going to be, be a layer of sludge? Oh, look at that. <laughs> yeah, so is there going to be a layer of sludge to clean up, or yeah. what, what's the process? So there? work in progress. Um, river was at 513, 512 this spring. Pretty high, probably semi-annual type flooding occurred. Um, however, um, in June, we were at 50846, so the actual elevation of that platform as proposed right now. I have to say these are all approximate. Um, so um, we do believe that the bottom layer will get inundated annually, um, both by ice and by a flood. And the, the balance is, do we connect people to the river or do we leave them five feet above the river? And um, talking with Parks Conservation Commission, the, the, the sentiment is that we'd rather have some, some mucking out to do periodically and have robust materials down there that the thing's not gonna shift, but we're getting connected to the river. Because the base of the river, if you see 75, 506, we're probably at 505 now. Like the river's way down prior to this rain so we're three and a half feet above the river but if we start to design for 510 you know 11 we're going to be like six you know height our height above you know six seven feet above above the river pretty disconnected now you see in the concept there are stairs down and that accommodates and there are some boulder features on the edge that may have platforms so they're tiered, so you could walk down according to the water level and go down and, and be connected with the river. So um, this is really a work in progress. We got the gauges in after the spring high flows. <clears throat> you can see the dates there. We're going to try to get a good handle on the ice level. Um, these have been referenced to the, to the elevations on the dams, but we're going to get a surveyor out there and really make sure the gauge elevations are all properly surveyed so we can make sure those numbers in the right column there are exact. So um, good point. Love to hear your feedback on where to put the bottom because it's, it's, it's either a little more maintenance or a little more connection to the river. It's a balance. Can you tell me for, con can you tell me for context what the river might be at right now? Um, I would say 505-ish, 506. It's really low. Well, it was or, right before well, this rain. I mean today, like today after, was, after the... Um, I didn't get out today, but I can probably go out tomorrow and tell you, um, like, where it is. It, it's coming down because it was, a, it was a short, intense rain last night. So if we're at, um, looks like June 20th, if we're at 512, and let's say there's there's a pretty thick layer of mud that gets deposited on that lower part. Yeah. Would we just wait for another flow to flush that out or would that be like people down there with shovels or? Um, so yes. we've had some, through this public process, some ideas have come up. Um, have volunteers around the city be like, um, be, I mean, it's not gonna, we don't expect 10 feet of silt in there, but it might be a layer. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd go down and wheelbarrow, shovel it out throw it on some gardens, probably have some nutrients in it, get it out of the floodplain. Um, annual maintenance, YCC type crew, um, or let it run and flush. I mean, it, there's there's some options there for maintenance. It doesn't, the, the, the thinking was that it's a volunteer level, half of a day job, that it doesn't require um, the city to make a big maintenance investment annually if we want to keep it on the lower side. That was sort of the thinking. <laughs> I hope you're right. <laughs> uh, and my last question would be um, just to keep it all within this time frame. What I saw on the previous slide about the CSO overflow there is like on the three to five year time scale. What would the experience of the park be like with the CSO still there right across the river in the North Branch? Um, well, I guess the first thing, you're bringing up some great points. Ice, really high flows, CSO overflow, like there's got to be a way to close off the river access um, while it's not safe to go into the river. Um, that said, um, we've been looking at the water quality. Um, 
the overflows are not very frequent, but if they did, you would maybe smell and see some things you don't want to see in a river, um, <laughs> and you wouldn't be able to swim in it. Um, not shown here, there are some E. coli issues on the North Branch that would that are not safe for contact. Friends of the Winooski is doing some, some recon work to try to identify the sources of that. Um, so I think, as Steve mentioned, and Ricarda and Regina, like, the park sets the stage. There's still work to do to really enable that contact recreation um, down in there. <laughs> Sula Barth, I live up the hill. Um, the first thing I noticed when I walked in the room is I was disappointed at how few people were here. Um, I just think this is such an exciting project. Um, next, I'm so glad to hear uh, your consideration of the rest of the riverfront um, because it's hideous. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the decrepitating remains of industrial development, <laughs> that some of which are probably over 100 years old or maybe more. Um, I, I just love to see it just expand all, all the way up. Um, you've addressed some of the things that I had concerns about. One is the water quality. I mean, I'm not sure I want to go swimming in there or boating <laughs> if it's level to tip over, you know? I, you know, I think that's an important, an important thing. Um, you said a little bit about flooding, but my concern is a lot of what I see looks like riprap. And I'm concerned about the riparian science behind that and whether we are doing damage uh, either at the confluence or downstream in terms of a rigid, unmovable bank. Um, so I am concerned about that. And I'd like to see something, I'd like to see that addressed. Um, I've watched, uh, I've watched one of the tributaries up in Worcester move back and forth, and deposit tons of river rocks on my son's yard. <laughs> um, so I would like to see you address those issues. Um, uh, uh, appreciating what it does when you when you constrict the channel, what it does downstream. Um, do I have something else? Oh yeah, the pictures, you know, the, 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 the concept drawings of the park and so forth and down to the riverfront. I don't know, it looks pretty formal and artificial to me. I, I'd like to see a riverfront that looks more natural. I, you know, I, I appreciate that you're probably using some, um, I don't know, kind of icon sort of things to plug in there and so forth, but um, I'd like to see it look a little more natural. And I think that goes along with my concern about the rigidity of the bank. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe comment about the water quality transition. And, and one thing that I think was really encouraging to us was to look at these other cities that have gone through this transition. I mean, you know, in downtown Denver, you know, you can get in the water down there. And so I think that's, you know, a hopeful sign that you can make these turnarounds for these rivers that, you know, historically have been used as dumping grounds. It's going to take work. It's going to take, you know, uh, a while to achieve that, but if, if there's any place to me in the state of Vermont we should be able to do this, it's in the city capital, in the, in the capital city. So I think that um, rallying the interest and the funding to really, you know, address the water quality challenges is something that is very feasible here. I mean, other places have done it, and I think we can do it here too. So. Well, I'm not sure I'd want to get in the water under the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, but it is pretty amazing. You see, there's many, many other urban areas that have, it's amazing what they've done to recreate that kind of high quality experience in the, in the river. So we're hopeful. I guess I might add something on the rigidity of the banks. Because um, in Montpelier, 
we're unfortunately <clears throat> stuck a bit. Um, yeah. You know, with the development, you know, the, the history has really led to more and more stuff closer and closer to the river. So um, creating a, a soft spot at this corner would really actually create a hazard to a lot of the stuff, including the new one tailor development. And, um, and there's a giant flood wall and a gas station across the river. Um, but all that said, um, so that, that just implies we can't do a full naturalistic design like at your son's property where the river can spill and move. No, they got rip rap all along. <laughs> so not naturalistic like that. But we can, we can Only part of um, imitate nature. So it may be rigid to a flood or an ice scouring event on the corner, but there can be plants that belong on a riverside planted all around those rocks. We call them joint plantings. Um, it's that not from that will actually serve riparian function for invertebrates and birds and things seeking cover um, and shade the water a little bit. There's very little shading. Um, there, all the riprap along and the walls along the rivers that you're seeing on the screen here heat the water and impair it for for all the aquatic life. So. You know, you're right. The more we can vegetate, even if it's rigid and we vegetate it and cover things, it's a step in the right direction. And we're going to try to make a first step in the right direction on this corner. But it's not going to be, I just want to be clear, it can't be naturally functioning because this will migrate and move into the railroad and everything else. So. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Richard Amore. Um, I've served on the advisory committee, so I'm very familiar with the project. But I just want to say um, thanks for VRC, the River Conservancy, to leading this project, the design team for actually making it so. It's a challenging site. Lots of things already in play with a multi-use path, the topography. It's a really small site to be able to provide ADA access down to the river. So I commend you on the design, commend you on the outreach you did with the community. And the only question I have, when can we build this thing? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, I was really grateful that you had in there the existing slope, like with those cut throughs, mm -hmm. so I could see uh, sort of where the natural bank exists currently. I was sort of shocked. Um, just in looking at this design, I thought, well, surely this would include like adding material out into the river when, when the river is low, because there's no way you know it goes out that far. But I suppose if you're if you're removing some mass from the bank, then it's the, that space is really there, um, which is pretty exciting. And it's it's just shocking to me like how much we can do with the space that is there, even though it is um, small. It's like there's a lot going on there, and I, I think that's pretty exciting. Um, one of the things that I, um, I was really grateful for the question about the sludge or potential maintenance. And sort of in that same vein, um, I mean, we, we pave a lot of things in Montpelier, and we repave a lot of things. Uh, and so just thinking about the materials that we're going to be using, and I know that's not the level of the design that we're at right now, but uh, you know, I think about this as a space that's going to probably experience some, some significant freeze-thaw um, uh, temperatures. And so are there examples of places with freeze-thaw cycles like ours that have infrastructure like this in or near the river that has lasted? Or if not, like, what is that maintenance like to maintain it? And maybe that's the, you know, the VYCC, um, sort of thing where they would you know come and if we need to move boulders around fine but does it mean like re-pouring cement for stairs or um, or what I don't know uh, and and so is it safe to assume that like that just as an example well actually all of it like so the pathways in that lowest level there the like what people would be walking on is more or less concrete or something like it uh, like a poured sort of substance? I think that um, 
Those are all questions that we've been grappling with, too. Yeah. And um, what I would say is that what we've been thinking about is thinking where the flood waters are likely to be. Those areas would be, we'd have to stabilize those in, in some way. So it would have, a, you know, a harder material. So whether it's flagstone set in and mortared in place or whether it's a pervious concrete or something like that. That's that's kind of the next phase of design that we start grappling with that. We start calling communities that have their riverfront parks like this and saying, what are you using and how's that lasted? There are a lot of the, the park examples that we showed are all relatively new, but they've been in place for a few years and so I feel like we've been thinking about it, um, especially down in the, the flood zone. We know that that needs to be resilient to floods, uh, freeze and thaw. Um, as you move up in the park, that's going to get a lot of activity. So we know that, you know, using like something like what I was talking about, the stabilized um, granite shavings or something similar to that that has a more natural feel but it's going to be stable enough they're using that material in at the Brooklyn River Park they're using it at, at botanical gardens and so it's it's a still a relatively new product but it, it has a lot of um, hope now how far down we can take that material is a question but those are all things that we really really in the next phase of design, that's going to be what we're really trying to figure out. What are those details? You know, the other thing I think you commented on, it looks like a lot of riprap, and, and that's not what we want to do. We, we want it to feel more intentional. So we want, we want to use, like, big, rounded boulders and, and river stones. And so part of, you know, the next phase of design is figuring out how to fit those pieces together and how to detail that so that it has the outcome and the look and the feel and the longevity of all the things that, that we're trying to achieve in, in the park. And now, obviously, that's going to be more expensive than just dumping riprap over a bank. But we all know what that looks like, and nobody wants that in this park. So um, to your point, I think that's going to be one of the major, major things in the next phase of design is, is really, really doing a deep dive and looking at that. work John Snell with the tree board among other things and uh, it looks to me like you're really talking about a major construction of the entire site not just adjusting things or putting things in but you're really building it from the ground up literally right is that right yeah there's yeah. a lot of excavation happen there yeah and in that process let's make sure we consider the trees because it's real easy to draw these trees on here. They look great. But, you know, to get a tree to grow successfully and stay growing is a whole other thing. And it can be done, but it's, it is significant investment. Gerton, I'm on the Conservation Commission, um, and I'm wondering, it's not a huge area, but I'm wondering um, about stormwater management and um, what happens with all that concrete if there's totally impervious surfaces with water coming off the Taylor Street parking lot and the bike path and that whole area. I don't know how that's designated but I'm assuming that's going to be considered as well yes okay yes is there because Taylor Street's supposed to have a lot of mitigation right stormwater management along the site okay yeah. so yeah is it possible to have pervious surfaces down by the river or would that just wash away in a flood Situation. I think these are all the questions that will get addressed yeah. in the technical design well, but certainly your point guard. Yeah, and certainly your point about, yeah. you know, in, integrating stormwater, absolutely, especially where we're creating the ramp system, the accessible path. Right. 
that could be a nightmare. So yeah, we definitely we need to yeah. consider that, and that will be considered in in the next phase of design during technical development. I actually, with that one exception, I really like the way you did the accessible path. I think that was because it's pretty creative getting it to go all the way around. Because otherwise, it would have been like this. And it's nice. It's, anyway, so something else to think about. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Page, um, one thing we had talked about above the higher flood levels of possibly doing some pervious along the path to sort of as the crown on the bike path sheds onto the site, then maybe that will infiltrate on the first layer, but that would be well above the flood levels, and then we transition it um, possibly to a more rigid surface on the bottom where we know the ice level is going to be and more frequent flooding. So that's kind of the thinking we have right now is actually having different surfaces for the similar elements, but guy based on the results of the water level study. So stormwater treatment on the top, flood resiliency on the bottom. And there will be, yeah, and you know, along both your a couple comments, there is quite a bit of fill removal here. So we're gonna create some flood storage in, in this area. Um, if two major rivers coming together, so it's not gonna appreciably change the flood levels per se, but you're gonna, not further encroach out into this system, which is exactly what we, we really can't do that here. There's too much stuff going on in the river, so it's a step in the right direction for sure. Hi, uh, Gary Holloway. Um, I'm also on the, uh, the steering committee. Uh, and I just want to say, you know, thanks to the River Conservancy for taking the lead on this project, um, you know, and getting support from the city, but really being the lead and driving um, this kind of project forward, um, you know, it has a real impact on you know the community and potential economic um, you know opportunities. Um, you know, this is this is not an easy site um, to work with. It makes it look so big uh, when you look at it in these pictures and maps, and then when you actually go there and realize how small the space is, the fact that you were able to incorporate so many elements into such a small space. Is, uh, is really impressive. Um, so I just want to say, you know, thank you for having a really thoughtful um, um, approach and, uh, you know, the level of public engagement throughout the entire process has been uh, tremendous. Uh, so I feel like there's been a lot of input from a lot of different people. Um, I agree with John, it's, you know, before you plant a tree, talk to this guy. <laughs> you know, and it's, you know, living in Vermont, um, you know, no matter what material we choose, um, you know, we, we continue to pave streets with asphalt, and it just doesn't work uh, in this environment, but yet we continue to do the same thing over and over again. So, um, looking at a park, I appreciate the comments in terms of, you know, maintenance and looking how, how we can kind of try and create something that's durable, um, you know, for the long term. Um, one question I did have uh, was in regards to the access uh, drop-off area, kayak area, uh, because I've been, I remember this came up in the past that, uh, you know, that's really one Taylor's uh, parking space. Um, you know, will, will there be access um, um, into that area um, as it's shown on here? Um, that is uh, a question that has not been answered yet. Okay. Um, yeah, re remains. Yeah. And as far as um, whether it would be allowable for boaters to drive in, you know, with their boat on their car, drop it off, and then drive out that ingress egress of the transit center, it um, yeah, still yet not to be. still do to be determined, and permission has not been granted. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's other ways, but this mm -hmm. was curious. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you all. And just so, so you know, we're aware of that question, but also ourselves don't have a, an answer. So, <coughs> so it's on the radar, though. Yeah. Thank yes, you. thank you. We work out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, I'm Michelle Braun from Friends of the Winooski River. This is a super exciting project. I'm really glad that you guys are doing it. Um, and I'm really glad that you brought up water quality. And <laughs> I just want to say, as the organization responsible for monitoring the water quality in the North Branch, it has never yet met the standard for swimming. Um, we are, we've been working for years to eliminate source by source by source as we 
discover them, then we continue to work on that. Um, to be clear, we started working on this before I had children, and my daughter's going to college. So <laughs> it might be a little while before. But I hope that with this as inspiration, um, the community will get behind that effort. Michelle, so. could I ask, what, are, what about the water quality in the Winoski River? Is that swimming? No. <laughs> if if you want to, well, you know, it does not meet the EPA standard uh, for E. coli. Um, a good place to swim that almost always meets the standard is at the North Branch Nature Center, um, but not within a day or two of heavy rain. Um, but in clear weather, the Nature Center is the place to go. So what's the point um, It. It changes over the, it has changed over the years. Essentially from Cumming Street down, uh, the, the way the standard works is it's essentially a, a risk level. So your risk, your likelihood of becoming sick from ingesting the water increases as you move downstream. And it, it spikes really high right under State Street. <laughs> <laughs> where we think there might be a, a, a source there. So. Uh, but you can check, uh, there are water quality reports on the Friends of the Winooski River website with really detailed data for years. And these guys have been checking that out. question um, and I also think this is a great project don't get me wrong but if you there's a plume of stuff under the Taylor Street area right or has that all been remediated the, the, the PFOAs or whatever they are the, the contamination, contamination of the soil yeah, yeah. are you going to run into any of that in the excavation process um, we believe we will that's why that the project is that's reflected in the range of the project okay. cost. Okay. Okay. Um, so, and just to let you know, we have met with the people who have dealt with the soil remediation aspects of the One Taylor project, mm -hmm. of which this little piece is connected to it. So, right. um, we sort of have a rough outline of what needs to happen um, to this the corrective action plan, the plan for the site in terms of the remediation. Um, so that's sort of on the radar. Okay. Because mm -hmm. it's a question that I've asked the city on a couple of occasions and haven't ever gotten an answer. But if you plant trees, and maybe it won't impact, maybe you'll do full remediation or whatever, but if you plant trees and they go down, the roots go down into this contamination, does that contaminate the leaves that subsequently fall into the river or anything else? Or how does that work? I guess work? it depends on, on the contaminants in the area. Um, some will stay on the soil, some might move into the trees. Um, this is sort of down the road, but you know, if it's a revegetation, we may over excavate, remove the contaminated soil, put in clean soil, and then plant in that. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a bunch of different ways depending on what. An environmental, you know, quality professional will say is is there, and, and how and what the level of contact is with people, and what the vegetation is, and all that. So okay. that's a part of the remediation that will take place on this site, you know, as part of the park design. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if anyone else has questions, but um, if you do, um, uh, I'm just going to open that up one more time. Anybody else have questions? <laughs> Great. Thank you again. Thank you. This site, in my mind, is somehow the center of the city. And I know it's small, but it's really important. And I'm really excited that, um, that we're having this conversation. That Thank you for all of your work. Thank you for being here. And I look forward to the next steps. So thanks. Okay. Thank you.